and turn everybody off. Okay, so now if you want to uh, chime in, you're going to have to chime in text-wise using the chat system. There's a little chat button at the bottom of the screen or somewhere on your conference call screen uh, says chat. And you can use that to ask questions, make comments or whatever. I'll try my best to keep an eye on that as we go. And then the last thing I'm going to do is share the slides. Okay, so today's parlor car chat topic um, is the Pacific Harbor Line, which is a short line railroad uh, that serves primarily or almost entirely the two ports that are down in LA, um, the port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach. And I have always been confused about what looks to me like one port. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is uh, there are two ports in the same spot, basically. Um, if you look at the map on the right, which is a close-up of the area, aerially, the green line is the Pacific Harbor Line Railroad. Uh, all of that stuff that the Pacific uh, Harbor Line Railroad goes to is the harbors, one or the other of the two. The Los Angeles Harbor, Port of Los Angeles, is kind of lower left of where the green lines go. And the Port of Long Beach are more right and more up um, uh, where those green lines go. That's the one of Long Beach. And I'm not really clear to this day where the dividing line is. Um, We'll, we'll talk about this a, a little bit more um, in a second about the what the ports uh, do and some basic stats. But the, for now, just note that the, the port of LA is, is the bigger of the ports, at least in terms of volume of, of what they bring in mostly and ship out to, I guess. So on the left is an area map, the Los Angeles Basin, or most of it, and it gives you a notion of where this port area is. Uh, within the red circles, are, there's the red dot, and that red dot uh, is where, on the left, the red dot is where um, the port area is, kind of on the left-hand side of it, where on the, on the right-hand side it says San Pedro. And the reason that dot is there on the right map as well is just to let you know where our cruise of the harbor started from, uh, it started from that red dot. We, we stayed at the, I think it was a Hilton Hotel. You'll see a picture of it here soon. Um, uh, drove down uh, and stayed at that ho hotel to, uh, in order to cruise around the harbor. <clears throat> okay, let's move along here. Here's an aerial view, a satellite imagery view of what we just talked about. Um, this whole port system, the left half generally being the port of Los Angeles and the right half uh, being the port of Long Beach. Here's a, um, an old picture, obviously I didn't take this, I just, grabbed it from, from some place. It's a picture of a, a bridge that sort of marked uh, the opening of the Long Beach port. This is in 1908. The rail, the rail bridge opened in 1908. The port of Long Beach kind of was going, I wasn't really clear about when the founding moment was but it was late 1800s, very late 1800s, or very early 1900s. And by now, 1908, um, when this bridge is open, um, it's, it's functioning. Uh, and they didn't have their dedication for the port until, two, uh, until 1911. Uh, this, is the, this is the port of Long Beach we're talking about. Um, today, 
um, or, well, in 2018, which is about as close as the most recent data I could come up with, the port of Long Beach, which is, remember, the number two port in, in terms of volume, um, handles about 8 million TEUs annually. And uh, I, of course, had to look up TEU. I, I suspect most of us would, uh, having no idea what that meant. Well, the answer is TEU stands for 20-foot equivalent unit. And what that refers to, the 20 feet, is a 20-foot 20, 20 container. So a TEU is essentially what you can put in a 20-foot container. So they brought in 8 million 20-foot containers worth of stuff in, in 2018. Now, of course, that doesn't, necessarily, that doesn't say anything about tonnage because it depends on how you foot fill the container, right? Um, but uh, generally, uh, it gives you the idea. That's how they talk about volumes in a port. Um, and that was up about 7% from 2017, uh, the year before. So th they were doing well at that time. Things are not the same anymore, um, although we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, and there's some references in the links for the post-show, you might say, that you can find on the website. Um, uh, they're doing okay down there now, uh, it, it would seem, uh, but you can read those and decide for yourself. Uh, now, here, here is a picture of uh, a cargo ship on the Port of L.A. side, and I'm going to use this picture to talk a little bit about the Port of L.A. Uh, um, Numbers-wise, the, uh, the port itself was dedicated or officially became an entity in 1907, um, and it became a part of the city of Los Angeles in 1909 when San Pedro and um, some other city, I'm not remember the, remembering the name of, uh, merged in, into uh, the city of Los Angeles. Uh, what's pictured here is the Benjamin Franklin uh, cargo ship, which is the largest, or at least as of 2015, the largest cargo ship that's, that's been in and out of the port of L.A. 18,000 TEUs. So you remember, like we just talked about, the TEU is basically a 20-foot container. So that ship can carry 18,000 20-foot containers. That's just like mind-boggling to me. Uh, um, <clears throat> it is the number one port uh, by volume and cargo value for the whole thing. Um, and they've been that way since 2000. I'm not sure what maybe... Long Beach was bigger up till 2000, or they went back and forth sharing the, the, the award, so to speak. But um, since 2000, the port has, has done more volume than Long Beach. The Port of LA has about 7,500 acres of land and water, if you can recall that map that we just looked at a minute ago, and 43 miles of waterfront in that 7,500 acres. That's, it always impresses me what the shoreline of a lake can be with all the ins and outs and down little culverts and this. It doesn't seem that big, but then they talk about the number of miles of, of waterfront around the lake. Um, and same thing here. It, I mean, it's designed, right, to have a lot of a waterfront. Okay, moving on. Let's see. I should check to make sure. Yeah, all right. We're still good. This slide gives me a chance to talk about the Alameda Corridor, which is this sort of ladder-looking thing that runs from lower left all the way up to kind of mid-center right at the top with that ladder-looking structure above it. That's the Alameda Corridor, corridor or part of it anyway, which is a trench, uh, a railroad trench, um, a freight rail expressway is another uh, way it's been termed. It runs 20 miles from the from the port uh, to where most of the mainline BNSF Union Pacific mostly trackage is more in town. Yeah. 
kind of in the, like the uh, Union Station area and, and so on. 15% of the nation's container traffic goes through this corridor. That's kind of amazing. Um, basically, they underground it. Uh, there, you, it's not covered. Those, those concrete beams or whatever they are that you see, they're kind of making the ladder steps. Um, it's open in between. The black area is actually looking down into the trench. And I think uh, the reason that that beam is there all that way is they ultimately can, if they want to, uh, electrify that rail line. So it would be a support for the catenary stuff um, all along that at least that part of the trench. Okay. I'm just adjusting myself here. Okay, so um, I this trip that we're going to show here in a second um, was a, actually a California Short Line Railroad Association meeting slash train ride. Um, that takes place every year, not necessarily touring the port, but takes place somewhere in California every year. And uh, the trip happened to be repeated twice in the time period when I was able to go on some of these, both uh, 2009 and 2015. So the pictures you're going to see are a mishmash of the photos I took uh, either one of those years, 2009 or 2015. And I didn't try to keep track of what year they were. That would have been a little much. Okay, so we're going to get started with the trip here. Uh, this is that Hilton, I believe, Hilton Hotel that I talked about in San Pedro, right along the marina of um, the port, the sort of private small boat marina that's either, I don't know if it's technically part of the port or just next to it, but they're all right there. So we disembarked uh, right from this location. And speaking of those boats, that was the view of things right outside the uh, hotel, was all the private boats. And in the distance there, you can see all the cranes and whatnot for the harbor itself. Uh, like I said, this was the uh, annual meeting of the CSLRA, and uh, the meeting occurred in that um, hotel with a, in a small conference room there. And then after the meeting, we headed for the boat. And uh, uh, as you can see, we're heading down the ramp to the spirit of whatever. I'm not sure what the name of the boat was, but you can see the word spirit on the side on the right. Um, and this would, this would be our... Uh, uh, transport and tour base, or the guide actually was both the captain, the pilot, and the tour guide for the for the trip, telling us what what it was we were seeing. And there, someone asked earlier about San Marino folks. Um, there was at least three of us: Rob, Nathan, and myself. Um, and I don't rem remember exactly who else, but there, there was at least that many of us. And uh, from the water, um, this is one of the first things a, we saw or any ship would see coming into the Los Angeles part of the port anyway. Docked alongside, um, kind of close to the marina that we just left, you can see some uh, sailboat sails uh, uh, in front of that ship on the far left in the distance. Uh, that ship is the Lane Victory. And let me get my notes pulled up for that. Um, currently docked in, in San Pedro. It's uh, a, a 1945 ship uh, that served in uh, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and as a merchant carrier in, in between years. And uh, it is, uh, it is visi visitable. Um, you can um, get on that ship and, and see things. And the uh, link there in the upper right is where you can go to learn more about that when they're open or if they're open even these days. 
Uh, let's see, I think I have another picture of that ship. Yeah. We didn't get a chance to go visit it, so I can't tell you exactly what it's like on board or inside. Um, but it looks like it should be fun if you've got time to do stuff down there. The uh, port is not unlike any other harbor area. All kinds of sea life around. Um, most of the floating buoys were um, staked out by these seals. Almost every one of them that had any kind of platform. And the ones that couldn't fit on the platforms, I guess, just had to stay home or at least shoreside to sunbathe. Um, this is an interesting um, thing we saw that isn't there anymore. Well, the ships might be there. I'm not sure about that. But Sea Launch was an operating space lift, putting satellites in orbit operation back in the day, meaning either 2009 or 2015. I'm not sure which here. Um, this was an operation that lasted about, oh, I don't know, 20 years, pushing 20 years. They were formed in 1995, and it was a conglomerate of four international countries, Norway, Russia, Ukraine, and the United States. And Boeing, the, the airline aircraft manufacturer, Boeing managed it. Um, the, the concept here was to take rockets down to the equator to launch them. And, and the, the idea is that that saves a lot of energy. And the more energy that you save, the more payload weight you can put on the rocket. And you, by going to the equator, you save energy requirements because of a number of things. One is you're at the, at the equator where the rotational speed of the Earth is the greatest. So you get that thrown into your speed for free, you might say. You also, if you launch from the equator and you're going to a, a geostationary orbit, which meaning it's, it's locked in place all the time around the Earth. It's always over the same spot. Then you don't have to do a plane change. You're already in the right plane uh, orbitally of where you need to be. And that alone can save you... 20% of your um, energy requirement, give or take. So your payload can be 20% heavier than it would be otherwise just because you're launching from the equator. Uh, another advantage of launching from the equator is that you can put uh, satellites into orbit going east-west, which is like a lot of satellites that we're familiar with, the space station, the Hubble telescope, um, and that sort of thing. Or you can put them into north-south orbits. Uh, well, first of all, let me say east-west. If you're, if you're going to go into an east-west orbit, you're going to launch from Cape Canaveral. That's what they do. That's, what all, that's the only thing they can do. If you want to launch north-south, which, which is the other option, which a lot of uh, communication, Earth observation satellites, that sort of thing, are launched from to go north-south around what they call polar orbit because it goes over the poles all the time. Those are strictly launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and that's all they can do. But at the equator where Sea Launch went, you can launch either way. You can go east-west if you want an east-west orbit. You can go polar if, if you want to go to polar. So for a number of reasons, it was seemed like anyway a good idea. Um, it didn't last, however. 2014 was its last year. They've been trying to sell it. I, I, every once in a while I'll read something about somebody being interested in it. I'm, I'm not sure where that status is right now. In the picture, the uh, platform that's pretty much in the center with the black and gray pillars, that's the launch platform. That's actually floating in water. That's not sitting on a deck. And those pillars control all the stabilization mechanism when they're out in the, in the seas. Uh, to, in order to keep the rocket steady um, for launch. And on the right-hand side, the much smaller vessel, you can see the gray hull and, and the white stuff on top, that's the command ship, which would be parked uh, several miles away from the launch platform um, 
in sort of a prepping position. That's where it would uh, launch from. Just like you don't get anybody within a couple of miles of a launch on land either. You keep everybody away for safety reasons. Uh, so let's see, I think we have a couple other pictures of what these guys look like. There's a, sort of a broadside view of the command ship uh, where everybody would be during uh, launch time. And there's a, that might be the better view actually here of uh, what's what. You can see that the pillars are in the water. Uh, you can tell that's the launch platform because there's actually a rocket erected there in, in its launch position. They, of course, would not launch here, but that's what it would look like floating out in the, uh, or in the middle of the, on the equator somewhere. And then the command vessels on the other side of the pier um, with sea launch written on the side. Now, just to uh, uh, follow up on the, the interesting space lift role that these two ports play, um, this is much more recent. To, uh, actually, I'm not sure about the year, but within the last few years, uh, this is SpaceX. Uh, and most of you are probably familiar with the fact that SpaceX is recovering their um, booster rockets, which you see sitting there on that platform. Uh, that's a recovered booster that put something in orbit and then flew back autonomously and landed uh, in one of two places, either, or several, one of two types of places. This being their uh, sea platform where it can come back and land on it anywhere in the uh, oceans. Uh, they also have some land-based uh, locations where the rocket can come back to. At least one of those is at Vandenberg, and I'm not sure. There's probably one at Cape Canaveral. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but a number, of, they often use uh, this water-based platform, and this happened to be the 15th successful recovery of a Falcon 9 rocket um, after SpaceX put something um, into orbit. And you can see it coming. There's that building with the Port of LA on the, on the side. All right, so now here's your first notion that there's a railroad running around this port, which if you recall those green lines on that first map, there's a railroad almost everywhere um, to haul containers out of, out of here. Um, BNSF and UP uh, work in here. I'm not sure I actually ever saw any UP locomotives in, in here, but I think they both companies have uh, trackage rights should someone want to use them. We're going to see, uh, I don't have a lot to say about some of these photos. They're just kind of impressive on their own right. So we'll just enjoy some of these of what the being in the port running around on a boat uh, looks like or lets you see. Obviously, this is a mega ship too. There's a couple of them. Two more tanker looking than, than uh, it could just be that they're empty. Uh, and all the infrastructure on the decks to unload, load and unload these things with. They definitely unload them, of course. They haul these, they're mostly this is stuff coming in, right? Um, I, there's got to be some volume of containers, either empty or light loads going back, but um, every once in a while I read stuff that says that doesn't happen too much, which is why you see a lot of containers end up in farm and whatnot because they're kind of a one-time use from the cargo ship's point of view. They're the pretty good size one. This photo gives you an idea of what the group looked like that I was part of and, and San Rey Valley Railroad was part of. Uh, and that guy, the white shirt with the, the pilot wheel at his left hand and the microphone at his right, he was in And um, captain of the ship, so he had his hands full for a couple hours as we tooled around. These structures that they have for offloading containers are just incredible. And of course, wherever these are, you'll find railroad tracks underneath. Um,
because most of the stuff is going to get put on trains to be taken out. Here's one of the several bridges. Um, there were uh, road bridges and rail bridges that uh, could be opened. Uh, that center section would rise uh, so that this, these ships could get through. As you, you might remember from that map at the beginning that there are a lot of ways and islands, quote unquote, to the uh, port. So, and you need to get ground transportation to them somewhere or another. And here, as we pass through one of those braised, which is, uh, one of those bridges, which has obviously been raised, um, you can see the railroad tracks coming at us and then dead ending uh, because the the track that would normally be right where we are at this point um, is a couple of stories overhead right now. And there's a couple of locomotives just having crossed the bridge when it's in its down position headed off to the right. There's a tractor tug. I assume that's basically a, 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 a bar, uh, what do they call them? Ha, the word just escaped me. Tugboat. And there's a little port of Los Angeles piece of infrastructure. They look way too relaxed. Um, in this port, I don't remember exactly where, uh, the USS Iowa is um, docked. And it is a part of a um, maritime museum now too, just like that Lane Victory was that we showed you earlier. Um, so there, here's another option if you want to um, see uh, Navy stuff, obviously. Um, and I think you have pretty good access to the boat, um, which is sort of part of the museum too. You can see in the, uh, this white tarp that's set up and uh, underneath these three guns up front, and you can see people, very small, but they're there um, on the deck checking it all out. There's a close-up of those folks and the three guns. <laughs> um, <laughs> this ship, um, I don't know if it's here normally, um, but it, uh, it, it, it goes in and out of this port periodically. It's a, the Naval Hospital Mercy. Um, this is here for to remind you of the anecdote. Not too long ago, like a few months ago, um, you may recall that a, uh, so a disturbed, I assume, uh, Pacific Harbor Line engineer tried to run this boat down with one of the PHL locomotives. And as you can imagine, he didn't get very far, a, a few feet off the end of the track, and that's about it. Um, but for somehow or another, he thought that would be a good way to attack um, this ship. There's an interesting view seaward of the port. Um, one of the entrances of the port from the sea to the left of that lighthouse. Here's another notion of what the infrastructure looks like. Well, I don't know how many of these we saw from older looking ones like this one seems to be to those much more modern ones like those white ones look to be and everything in between. Another bridge or the other side of the same bridge that we saw before, I'm not sure which. That kind of gives you a feel of how small we felt as we went underneath these things. And we weren't actually even underneath it. We were off to the side. You can see there's a, actually a ship sitting there. You can see the red a little bit. Uh, a little bit. So we were even not that close.
140 trains a day, I think, is what I read, go in and out of this port. Um, and there are obviously unit trains, generally speaking, they're unit trains of containers. Um, that's a lot of stuff that gets taken off these ships, put on trains, and sent out. Or I guess half of those would be incoming to get containers, but still, 70 unit trains of containers, that's a lot. It was fun to see the color schemes. Uh, you've already seen a number of red and white, white, blue and gold here, green and gold. I mean, it was amazing the number of color schemes that we saw uh, along the way. There's our skipper again as we go past uh, what looks to be a tanker of some sort. In addition to, to car, uh, container cargo, it's not the only thing that comes in in here. There's both uh, bulk wet goods like oil and there's also bulk um, goods dry, um, hulls of uh, grains or uh, I don't know, whatever dry material that you might all over here on, a, on a, one of these big ships. Here's an old fire boat that's being restored. Um, I think this is near the Maritime Museum, which is associated with the um, USS Iowa. Okay, we're going to take a pause. Oh, I see somebody tried to say something here. Let me get a... Let's see if I can get a better look at it. Oh, uh, they're asking, are the containers placed directly on trains? I don't know the answer to that question, although I suspect it's true, um, or at least to the extent possible. Obviously, the train has to be there or it has to have left cars earlier to do that, but I don't recall seeing a lot of containers sitting on the ground or the dock um, waiting for a train to come by. I think they try to do that directly. The train tracks generally run underneath those um, fixed position cranes, you might say. So. Um, uh, I don't know. The, the comment, a follow-up, didn't see many photos of trains right next to the ships. Well, you also didn't see too many of those cranes actually operating. So it could easily have been um, a moment in time when neither trains were there nor, they were, nor were they actively unloading. There was that one picture of a container held in the air, um, and it was too close up to tell if there was a train there or not. That's a good question. Uh, maybe I... I'll try and figure that out. Here's the group getting ready to board the train that we're going to uh, not only tour the rail, tour the some side of the port by train, uh, but mainly this is we're heading to San Diego now, so we're going to just see some of the interesting sights along the way on a trip to San, uh, San Diego. Um, this theater car. Uh, if you ever get a chance to ride in one, it's, it is so cool. Um, I think I have a picture of it uh, from the inside. But you can see that this is the back end of the train, and on the far right there, sort of like with the guy blocking the view, you can tell that the back end of the train is all glass. And, and inside there, the seats are raked like in a theater, meaning they get higher as you go back, and uh, so it, that's why they call it a theater car. You can sit 20-ish people, 30 maybe, in that theater that have a direct view out the back end of the train in the comfort, air-conditioned comfort, and uh, drink service and whatever of the train. So it's, it's pretty darn cool. Uh, this will give you an idea of what the train looks like. The BNSF Special, um, they're, they're fun cars, you might say, um, inside. Here we're going by some of the, remember this is partly about the Pacific 
Pacific Harbor Line. I, did, I didn't really see too much of that, but here's one example. There's some Pacific Harbor Line PHL uh, locomotives sitting on a track that we're going, um, we're, or we're on the uh, excursion train now, so we're uh, looking at it from across the yard. There's a picture from a little bit closer. That is Otis Plate. Yeah, he was the president of the PHL at the time, and I think he still is. That logo on the locomotive I, is, is their logo, so if you see something that looks like that, that's who you're talking about, Pacific Harbor Line. Here's a picture uh, crossing some of those bridges that cross the terminal uh, waterways. Obviously, they're in the down position for us. I don't, uh, the uh, second section of the green bridge that goes up and down, I think, is to our left off the picture, sort of behind us, so we can't really tell what its position is. Here's our special train crossing a bridge. I don't know that it's particularly a port bridge, because now, at this point, we're headed towards, toward downtown L.A., and at some point, we'll will veer off and take the main line down towards to San Diego. With some interesting uh, industries along the way, including this one, um, that I, I, they, I'm trying to remember what they make. I'm not sure if it's plastic pellets or something, but whatever it is, they put in those container cars um, uh, hopper cars that you can see uh, in the yard there, in the, in the, in the uh, just below the uh, industrial-looking stuff above it. Uh, and these, this, in, in, the name of this company is Ineos, I-N-E-O-S, and they are, or at least were, pretty sure they still are, customer of the Santa Maria Valley Railroad for storing those cars. They had uh, very limited locations at the at the, this location right there in LA um, for the number of hopper cars they needed to move their goods in and out. Um, so they would store a number of them at Santa Maria Valley and they would call them down when they needed them and return them when they were done um, for the waiting on the next rotation you might say. And I think we have, yeah, here's uh, one of those container cars right here parked alongside the warehouse or some kind of building for the system. Okay, now we're in the Alameda Corridor. Remember that stretch, 20 mile stretch of uh, uh, trenched three rail, uh, three track uh, system that runs uh, between the port and kind of a downtown LA area. And now you can see what those ladder things that make it look like a ladder when you take the picture aerially are these concrete beams which support lighting and so on, and I think are ultimately in place for doing uh, electrification of the line. There's another view of that from the top of the train. Obviously, there was a pretty cool observation car on this train. Now we're a little closer to down, downtown L.A. Um, with the, these channels should be recognizable to most people who have driven around down there. I'm not sure where Union Station is relative to this picture, but we might be close. Another shot inside the, the train, just to give you an idea what an appointment looks like. Here's a picture of, from inside that theater car that I was explaining earlier. Um, it is a really cool experience to uh, watch everything and anything that you can from that from that locale. And up on the top, um, you can see a TV screen that has some words on it right now. And to the left of that, you can see some gauges. You can tell what direction you're headed, how fast you're going, um, all that sort of thing. It's, it's pretty impressive. There's part of the yard. There's a UP train. We're not in the port anymore, obviously, but um, you can see the port in the distance. Behind there are some very kind of grayed out uh, container lifting apparatus. And now we're, I think at this point, we're kind of on the main line out of, out of there, heading to San Diego. 
you go. Then here comes one of those container trains, probably had just been at the port. And another container train. You gotta really like container trains to watch traffic down there, I guess. Uh, this is Fullerton um, uh, Amtrak station, and it's on the main line, of course, for BNSF UP trains. There's a, uh, just for a fun fact, there's a great little bar restaurant called Heroes at Fullerton. It's an easy walking distance from the train station here. Their uh, uh, slogan is, go big or go home. And among other things, they will make you a quart size Long Island iced tea. Now, you can tuck that information away if you ever get down there to Fullerton, you know, have at it. Back inside the train car. Uh, one of the things you see along the way to San Diego is the San Onofre nuclear power plant, which is what we're looking at here through the windows of the train. You also go by uh, uh, Pendleton, the Marine Corps uh, camp nearby. And you can almost always catch activity of some kind or another, whether it's helicopters or tanks or whatever. It's, it's a pretty active place. Here's our train working its way down towards San Diego. Uh, the Del Mar racetrack is one of the places you go by. This picture was taken from the train, so it's right there. Um, and it looks like a, they're doing something there today. It's not, stands aren't full. I don't think it's an actual race, but they're doing a lot of work. You can see tractors and cars and whatnot on the racetrack. There's our train again. And now we're in San Diego. Um, this is on the side of the track away from the station. These nice pillars and flowers. It's, it's really pretty. I, I love the San Diego train station. It, it's really nice. It's an old Santa Fe uh, building. There's our locomotive and crew sitting next to an Amtrak train. You can uh, on the far right that blue and silver. There's a full picture of our train. And another BNSF locomotive and an Amtrak train coming in. Uh, this was an interesting car that happened to be there one of those two years that we were there. The Cyrus K Holiday, it's a, a private car. It was built in 1921 for the president of the Sioux Line. And it's always been an item of discussion. Why would the Sioux Line name one of its cars for the president of the AT and SF, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe? And uh, the best answer I ever saw was that while it belonged to the Sioux Line, it, it wasn't named this. It, was, it just had a, a standard Sioux Line number, and, and that was it. But eventually it got uh, bought by the... Uh, Sioux Line uh, uh, for its president from the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Or the other way around. Sorry. Here's a couple of pictures of the station. Uh, the inset picture in the upper left or to the left is uh, some of the tile work that's inside, oh, inside or outside, I don't remember now. And then uh, you can see an entrance there uh, the bigger picture on the right into that station. This is how close the station is to the water. It's not very many blocks away. And cruise ships come and go. I think there's even a some sort of a museum or a ship thing down there too that you can visit if you want to. Just an interesting picture of some of the buildings. Uh, leaving the station you go a couple miles anyway through uh, some felt relatively modern high-rise buildings. It's, it's really kind of uh, sharp, sleek, um, this kind of nature to it, very high-tech looking. And this again from the train, you're awful really 
close to the to the airport. Maybe not this close because I did have a little bit of a zoom going on here, but um, it's pretty close. And not not while it's sitting at the station. This is down the line a little bit. And you're also very close to the water. Again, uh, I think I have a 10 power zoom. This is about all I can get out of my uh, camera. And I took this picture from the train as well, of these two guys heading out to sea. And these two gals playing on the, in the sand. All these are from the train. This is uh, the El Toro Air Station. Every time I think of El Toro Ice Station, I, I can't help but thinking of Independence Day, the movie, Independence Day with uh, Will Smith. El Toro was where he was stationed in the story <clears throat> and came back to after the aliens had destroyed it. Um, again, shot from the train, as you can tell from the picture in the lower half of the screen, Looking down the runway, I'm not sure what runway this is. Um, it might be, um, uh, what is the name of the, the, um, the, there's a station on this line that uh, the railroad has a station stop and the airport is, uh, they're both right there and the city airport, that I mean the commercial airport is right next to the Amtrak station there. And then there's a more uh, general aviation airport that's just down the track a little bit from there. I can't believe I can't think. Of Burbank. Burbank. This might be um, there. We're kind of doing this again a little bit. Another shot of a Pacific Harbor line as we come back from the end of the trip down to San Diego. And here's our train uh, as it was uh, stopped to let us get off, uh, now back at the port. Okay, that's it for today's uh, presentation. Let me remind you of a couple of things. Um, to keep track of what's going on, go to that web page that's at the top of the screen, Parlor Car Chats. Um, we'd love it if you would take the time to do the survey about the Parlor chats. It'll only take a couple, three minutes um, telling you uh, mainly what we're looking for is what topics do you want to see covered and uh, what dates and what days of the week, times of day are best for you. We've seemed to have settled into this Saturday um, 10 o'clock Pacific time quite well. So I'm, I'm not looking to move that unless I see a lot of indication that we want another time. And lastly, uh, we'll promote the next parlor car session, which will be on July 11th. We're going to take next Saturday off as that's the 4th of July. So there uh, won't be any parlor car chat on the 4th of July. The next one on July 11th, um, Rob Venetto and Nathan Paul will do uh, will be the presenters. And it will be all about Santa Maria Valley uh, Railroad. So let me um, open things back up again and uh, see if anybody has any questions at this point. Okay, so everybody should be back in now if you want to chime in with anything. Otherwise, we will call it quits. Okay, well, very good. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we will see you in two weeks. Uh, for Santa Maria Valley Railroad. Thank you, Jamie. You betcha. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. That was great. Excellent.